Thank you very much. Um, so I, I don't know how many of you guys saw the, uh, my presentation yesterday. Uh, this is kind of an extension of that and, and kind of diving into a bit more detail. Um, so uh, hang on. I just want to do this little guy here. Sorry, I started a little transcriber app that Sean uh, told me about back there. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're Red5 Pro. We uh, enable live real-time streaming. At, and when we mean real-time, uh, we mean like under 500 milliseconds of latency uh, to millions uh, of concurrent viewers. Um, and what we're talking about today is just about the, uh, the future of live streaming. And we think it's uh, interactive. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, latency is really critical. And why is this uh, future right now? I think that it's a combination of a couple of things. One is that mobile computing is, uh, you know, prevalent. Everybody has a smartphone at this point. Um, and on top of that, you've got bandwidth, which is increased uh, drastically, especially with mobile. And now with 5G coming out, this is going to be a major revolution in terms of the way uh, user experiences are happening. And I think live video is going to be a big part of that. And live video itself is changing quite a bit. Um, what we're seeing is uh, highly interactive kind of experiences that really rely on real-time latency. And interactivity is, is just expected at this point. Um, you know, you've got the live chats that are going on with the, with the streams. You've got people texting even during an event, like a sports game. Somebody's texting you to score before you even see it. You know, there's all these kind of things that are happening. And it's all because of the way we use our smartphones today. And I'm mean, sure most of you guys have heard of HQ Trivia. Uh, this is a really pretty good example of like the beginnings of what's starting to happen in live entertainment. Um, how many of you guys have played this or know what this is? Probably most of you. Okay. Um, we think that this is really just the beginning. Uh, the, we're starting to see like other use cases emerge. I went over some of the ones that we're seeing with our customers yesterday. Um, and I don't really want to spend a ton of time on that today uh, because I want to kind of dive into the tech and, and the choices that you have um, out there to build these kind of real-time live streaming apps or you know, what people call low latency. Um, so let's just dive right into the tech. There's basically three uh, basic protocols that you can use to build a live streaming app um, with low latency today. You've got the HTTP-based protocols. You've got this uh, WebSocket plus MSC, which is a media uh, source extension, uh, which is a web standards. Um, and another web standard, which is WebRTC. I was going to go quickly over kind of the approaches and the, the, dis the advantages and the disadvantages of each of them and kind of explain, you know, what's out there today. So with HTTP-based protocols, the ones that are kind of doing what they call low latency um, are these LHLS, which is what Twitter came up with, uh, a different approach to doing HLS or HTTP live streaming, where they basically uh, transfer to chunks and they're constantly trying to get the next one in, and they don't wait for the other uh, you know, three chunks in the system to get there before it. And then CMAF is basically doing the same thing. It's just uh, based on MPEG Dash, and it's more of a web standard. Uh, I think the advantages to this is that you can use existing infrastructure, like CDNs, uh, to deliver this. It's just HTTP-based. Uh, it's easy to navigate firewalls because you know uh, corporate uh, your organizations are going to open up firewalls for HTTP content, of course. Um, it's supported across a whole ton of devices, and it's also supported in uh, most of players, like you know, JW Player, uh, VideoJS, and stuff like that. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is the high latency. Um, and some, I know a lot of people would probably argue that two seconds is very low latency, but in our opinion, that's... Uh, you know, that's a huge amount of delay, and when you have interactivity going on with it, it's, uh, it's going to become problematic. And I also think that consumers are going to get used to real-time latency uh, and start to expect this, and two seconds is just going to feel like an eternity at that point. 
Um, and then also, you know, TCP uh, is the base protocol of HTTP, which means it's all ordered packets and you can get build up and other things that, that might be an issue. So current vendors today that are really kind of behind the CMAF stuff, or I would say Bitmovin, of course, because I think their research led to this. Um, and Akamai is also big behind CMAF. The other approach is to use WebSockets. Um, how many of you guys know what a WebSocket is in a browser? Yeah. So it's, it's basically a TCP socket that's supported in most browsers uh, today. Um, and you can use that to deliver or receive any kind of information. In this case, people are using it to send video data over it. Um, and then they're using this media source extension to basically extract the video out, right, and render it on the device. Now, it has some advantages. It's much easier to set up, and you've got pretty fast transfer over WebSockets. Um, but, it, it, and it's also much easier to implement than WebRTC. WebRTC is a very complex protocol. Um, but the disadvantages here are that it's also, uh, you can't use the existing infrastructure like CDNs or uh, anything like that. It's HTTP based. It's also got pretty high latency because the MSC part is, uh, it takes a while to render. And um, because of that, you're, you're in the one to three second range. And it's also not consistent from what we've seen. It's like you can be one second sometimes, and there's other times it's more like three. And that, that's also problematic. Um, and it's TCP based, once again, it's not UDP. Uh, and it's the worst one I think is MSC is just not supported by iOS, uh, Safari. So then you've like cut out all of those users, uh, which is a pretty significant chunk. Um, and it's not encrypted. Uh, so, so some of the vendors who are taking this approach are Wowza, the Wowza Cloud, the ultra low latency thing. Uh, that, that's based on this approach. Uh, Nano Cosmos is also implementing one like this. And then to WebRTC, which is the approach that we took, um, we think there's a lot of clear advantages to doing this. And the biggest one is the latency. I mean, we can get you know, 200, mil 200 milliseconds in many cases, um, but hardly ever over 500 milliseconds of latency across the internet. And you know, we have a demo over in our booth uh, showing us streaming from here in New York to Paris and back, and you know we're getting about 300 milliseconds even on this crappy network. Um, <laughs> so I think that that says a lot, you know. Um, and you know it it also you know, a lot of people are like, okay, you're going to have problems with firewalls, right? And it turns out that WebRTC also has baked into it this way of navigating firewalls, uh, which is called stun and turn. Um, and basically, by using these things, you can navigate around the firewalls and, and get through in most cases. It even has TCP failover, so if you can't get through on UDP, then you can fall back to TCP and you're still going to receive the video. Um, it's also secure. It uses DTLS, uh, which is a datagram TLS implementation, and SRTP, which is a secure real-time protocol to deliver the package. So, um, the, be the disadvantages, once again, you can't use a CDN. Um, and you, it, it's also very complex uh, to set up. And it doesn't work with any other players. So we're actually t talking to other player uh, vendors to see if we can get them to implement the WebRTC standard so that we can start doing that. Uh, current vendors are out there, uh, Red5 Pro, Phoenix, uh, TalkBox. Um, those, those are some of the primary ones that are doing this approach. Uh, uh, Millicast is doing it. These guys are here today. So Richard's company there. Um, and it, you know, just quickly, I want to talk a bit about deployment models as well because I think this is incredibly important. You're, you're, there are different ways that you can do it. Most people are doing this kind of platform as a service type thing, but you can also host your own, uh, or you could do the approach that we're taking, which is what we're calling a hosting agnostic approach. So I'll give you kind of lowdown on the advantages and disadvantages of each of them, and also talk about the current vendors. So uh, the hosted Platform as a service, this is pretty standard. You know, it's like you basically don't have to deal with the server infrastructure at all. So that's the huge advantage of it. It's really easy. You just get the, the SDK or whatever, and then you just plug into it and you go. Uh, the disadvantage is that, you know, it's generally a higher price because they're basically passing on the cloud cost to you. 
Um, and you also have vendor lock-in, so you're like stuck with whatever it is. Um, current uh, solutions out there like TalkBox, Wowza Cloud, Phoenix, uh, the, all of these guys are doing this kind of hosted platform as a service. Um, and, you know, I, 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 it's a funny thing about TalkBox, um, we, we often joke about TalkBox as being our gateway drug because they end up getting to a point uh, where applications are starting to scale. They're locked into TalkBox and it's not working for them. It's just playing from a financial model standpoint. And then so they end up uh, coming to us because of that. The other way to do this is you go and host it yourself. You get your own data centers, uh, you, you set it up all yourself. Uh, I think this is pretty obvious to what the advantages are here. It's like you're in total control of the setup uh, and no vendor lock-in. But uh, it's also more difficult to do. You gotta have staff that does it and, and deal with all of this stuff. So um, we also support this. We actually have like uh, military contractors and uh, you know, government agencies who absolutely need to control the environment. And so they deploy it that way. Um, and then there's also some open source solutions like Corento who does WebRTC that you could deploy yourself. It's open source, it's free, uh, but it's hard to scale it because you, know, you can probably get about 130 uh, video streaming connections on a, a typical box and then you gotta figure out how you're gonna cluster it to go out. So, um, it, and then our approach. So, so the way we're doing it is we're saying, we don't even care where you deploy this stuff. Um, we support a bunch of different cloud networks and it does auto scaling where it spins up and spins down instances and creates this giant real time, uh, essentially content delivery network out of cloud networks. Advantage with this is it's flexible. Uh, you aren't locked into any hosting solution. Uh, it, the disadvantage of course is it's slightly harder to do in a platform as a service. Um, and as far as I know in the video streaming space, we're the only ones that do this right now, so. And I'm just gonna go over quickly what this means. So each one of these uh, up here are uh, a, an instance. So let's say we're using AWS uh, with our setup. These origin servers would be EC2 instances. These edges would be EC2 instances. And publishers uh, broadcast or the encoders connect into the origins and then uh, subscribers connect to the edges. And you can scale out as many origins as you need and as many edges as you need. It'll auto detect that. Now, if you start getting um, even higher scale, we can stick relays in the middle, which then means it fans out exponentially. So this is where we can get the millions of concurrent viewers uh, because eventually, if you do it with just an origin connected to an edge, you run out of the number of connections that an origin can actually have. It's around probably about 500 streams going out. And then so, if you can do a setup where you've got 500 times 500, I don't know what the math is on that, that that's basically your cap on just doing a single connection. But the second you add this in, it becomes uh, exponentially larger. <coughs> Hopefully that makes sense. Anybody have any questions about that? But it's pretty simple, just uh, fanning out kind of model for one to many. And the brains of our operations is this thing called a stream manager. Um, it's the one that's actually spinning up and spinning down the instances on the network. It has its own REST API. So I'll just walk you through this quickly. So the first thing is a broadcaster wants to broadcast. It's going to make a request to the stream manager to get assigned an origin. And then it's going to connect to the origin and then start streaming to it. Um, and then that's relaying to an edge. And then that becomes available. The subscriber actually goes up and makes a connection to the uh, stream manager. It returns an address for the edge and then it connects directly to the edge and the video starts flowing to it. So it's always this kind of first step, connect to the stream manager, and then uh, you start getting the stream from either the origin or the edge that you're trying to connect to. So a stream manager acts like a request router that a CDN would do? Yeah, it's very much like a request router. Um, it's also doing the spinning up and spinning down of the instances using the cloud API. So in the case of AWS, it's going and using AWS's API to um, spin up and spin down the instances. Um, so that's what's happening here. And it'll do this auto automatically. You can set thresholds with the stream manager configurations to actually add uh, and remove edges when you hit certain thresholds. So if you hit capacity, 
or usually what we recommend is uh, set it at about half the actual capacity of an edge. And then so that while it's spinning up new ones, you still have capacity on those that are getting flooded at that point. And then you can, it'll end up scaling out. And then when the traffic goes away, it starts removing them and goes back to the original state. So that's what this is showing here. Um, this all said, there is actually uh, a problem with all of this with WebRTC because WebRTC requires everything to be secure. Um, and, and that means that you need SSL certs in order to make a connection to the server. Uh, we actually, so it's kind of impractical if you're spinning up these if, uh, instances and they're, they don't have state, right? So you've added a new edge, add another edge, add another edge. To install certs on these or SSL certs, it would become impractical. And then you have to maintain the domains of each of them and you'd have to keep track of it. It just gets ugly. So we ended up uh, taking a different approach. We actually proxy the WebSocket call, which does the signaling that connects you to peer-to-peer. -to -peer. So this step, step by step, this phone is making a connection over a secure WebSocket to the stream manager. Stream manager is then using over the back end channel, uh, unsecure WebSocket to communicate. And so it's doing the ICE negotiation. And once it sets up and exchanges that, then it makes a peer-to-peer -peer connection and then it can start publishing directly to the origin. Uh, the same thing would be to, with an edge as well, where you would actually have uh, the same process going on and then the video would start flowing that way to the uh, device that's su subscribing to the stream. This, this works pretty well. Um, this is kind of a, another breakdown of how all of that works. And I'll make sure that you guys can get copies of these, uh, of these slides so you can take a look at it in more detail because this starts to get pretty complex pretty quickly. But it's just the idea of the stream managers, which are usually load balanced. Um, can then handle these WebSocket calls. And then the video de uh, delivery is over SRTP and direct from the edges um, or to the origins. So um, that's, that's basically our setup right now. Um, what, what we're, that's one of, so we've got, let's just review really quick what the different types are, right? So you've got hosted, platform as a service, host your own, and hosting agnostic. Um, I think there's new deployment models that are really interesting, and th this is something that I'm going to announce today. We haven't really gone public with this, but we are, oh, great. I'm, not, I'm having a little trouble with this thing. Um, we are announcing uh, that we, we're coming up with a new blockchain approach uh, to uh, deploying the server instances. And what this means is basically uh, we're leveraging existing hardware that's in data centers and uh, a lot of these other groups that um, have excess capacity can start hosting these nodes and start streaming the content. And then they get compensated for their bandwidth with this proof of bandwidth um, setup. And uh, basically uh, we create this whole platform of a service without having to own any of the servers. So it's, a, it's sort of like a, from a business model perspective, it's a lot like Uber or Airbnb in a sense that we're matching people that want to stream videos uh, with uh, groups that have excess capacity in their data centers. And through that, we're creating the same exact uh, clustering infrastructure, that origin to relay to edge, uh, but it's through all of these uh, nodes that you don't necessarily trust. And they're getting compensated uh, by it's not quite a crypto token, but it's actually using the blockchain to actually do the tabulations and becoming the ledger so that we can track who gets paid what. Nobody has to trust us to even report on that correctly. And then once they do that, then we give them uh, cash for their bandwidth. So it's a, it's a pretty cool setup. It's, uh, we think it's uh, something that's gonna be kind of revolutionary and we plan to launch this in the first quarter of next year. We're actually at a conference uh, in June. It's kind of a really academic conference in uh, uh, Western Mass. I, I forget the name of it right now because uh, I guess I'm, what's it? MMSIS. MMSIS, yeah. So we're, we're actually showing off uh, a demo of this and, and kind of uh, our white papers. And if anybody wants access to and re wants to read the white papers on how we're approaching this, I'd be glad to share that with you guys. So. Um, but the, this is where we're going. This is a, kind of the exciting thing. Um, I guess this is a good opportunity to open it up for questions. Um, how are we doing on time here? One minute. One minute. All right. 
We don't get a little bit of flexibility given the technical di difficulties we had? I gave you the extra eight minutes. All right, cool. You got it. So anybody have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Hold on, let me get the mic over here. Okay, how, how much of the extra latency you add when you are act, add, adding more proxies there? Yeah, so we have the, th that's a great question. So we have the three hops, right? You've got the origin to relay to edge. Um, it's really minimal. Um, it's just the network latency. And then typically, uh, if you're using a, a cloud backbone, they've actually got that really highly optimized. So we've seen it to be really negligible, um, you know, maybe adding another 50 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. So, 